Okay, this is the uh, review session for the final. Um, for both the scheduled exam and the conflict exam, the topical areas are the last three areas we dealt with in class, pipes and pipe flow networks, which are weeks 10 through 11, um, external flows, which is week 12, and open channel flows, which is week 13. And specifically for the uh, scheduled exam, the three questions, um, in this case, again, an hour and a half, 90 minutes, but we have to clear out of the um, chamber, the, the room at uh, 110 minutes because the next class will be coming in. The three questions include uh, the 1D energy equation, um, pipe flows, which we dealt with in weeks 10 and 11, uh, specifically a type 3 problem. Uh, external flows uh, with a force balance to be able to define a, a force or a trajectory for uh, an object, and one on open channel flow, which is specifically uh, GVFs, gradually varying flows. And so uh, I'll just go quickly through some of the key uh, components of those uh, three questions, uh, just to really summarize the expressions you need to know. Uh, if you know them, you certainly will have enough to do the exam, uh, but you need to know how to use them, of course. So the first components are the energy equation. Um, you're quite familiar with that. Uh, it's for flow through a system of pipes between an upstream and a downstream. We have to be careful to define the upstream and downstream, and um, because that because there are losses within the system. And so the energy equation is written in terms of uh, heads, elevation head, pressure head, velocity head, plus uh, pump head, and has to be equal to the terms downstream, which are elevation head, pressure head, velocity head, and the losses in the system. And the losses are either due to major losses, which would be something like a friction factor, the length to diameter ratio of the pipe, and the velocity squared over 2g term in the pipe. It's important that this is in the pipe and not either upstream or downstream. They might be the same, but not necessarily. And the sum of all the um, minor head losses which is usually done as a loss coefficient, k sub l. Again, the velocity in that fitting, um, because this is typically a single value, the assumption usually is that it's um, a turbulent flow within the fitting. And I suppose the other thing is that the pump head is given by the power of the pump in watts divided by gravity times the mass flow rate, which is the same as the power divided by gravity, density, and volumetric flow rate, which are the, the same things. And so uh, we apply these to uh, pipe flow. Um, and so when we look at flow in individual pipe networks, I suppose um, we use typically the Moody chart. And the Moody chart allows us to be able to say something about the magnitude of this friction factor as a function of whether we are uh, laminar or turbulent. Uh, the behaviors on either side of that curve are different. It's indexed in terms of Reynolds number, which is typically a velocity, the density of the fluid, and a characteristic dimension divided by the viscosity. Um, and depending on where we are, uh, we can typically this threshold is something like a Reynolds number of 2000. Um, in this regime, the friction factor is typically proportional to some constant divided by Reynolds number, where Reynolds number is defined in this way here. And in this region here, oops, the um, Behavior is defined in terms of typically roughnesses, where each of these individual curves would represent a relative roughness, um, where magnitudes increase as you go up in here. So the two different behaviors that uh, 
you get from this. And typically we can um, solve a variety of problems. Um, the class of those problems are defined as either one, two, or three, depending on what we're trying to solve for. Class proof two problems, uh, typically we were given uh, velocity or flow rate, and we solve for um, the head loss within the system, which of course would be this, these parameters here. These would be the combined head losses due to both um, major losses in the first one and minor losses in the second one. Type uh, two type problems where we're actually trying to solve for either velocity or the flow rate. And type three problems where we're typically trying to solve for not often a length, but sometimes a pipe diameter or a um, roughness in the system, which we don't necessarily always know. And so this is the, the kind of problem that you have to solve for. Uh, typically, the solution method is to be able to define, if you know what the velocity is, you can figure out what the Reynolds number is. So if you know what the Reynolds number is, you know where in this regime you sit, and therefore you can calculate a friction factor somehow by going from the Reynolds number to the friction factor. So this gives you a friction factor, and if you have that, you're able to calculate um, from this kind of expression a revised velocity, which allows you then typically to recalculate a Reynolds number and go through this and make sure that you satisfy the, the system. Um, we know that if we are in the laminar regime, then the friction factor is a function of um, Reynolds number, and it's typically not a function of relative roughness. And we know if we're in the turbulent regime, the friction factor is typically not a function of Reynolds number, but a function of the relative roughness of the system. And so the, the solution methods are slightly different between these regimes, and we just have to realize for which one uh, we're in. For non-circular pipes, uh, we know that we can calculate um, a hydraulic diameter which is equal to four times the area of the cross flow cross-section divided by the wetted perimeter. And we can also define the Reynolds number in terms of the density, the velocity, and the hydraulic diameter of the system. And so these, this term here is the same one that would get used in both of these uh, circumstances. So that's important to, to know as well. If we're talking about um, pipe networks, then actually let me not, not do that there. Let me do it over here. Then we can define networks in two or three different geometries, I guess. Um, we can either define them in terms of um, a series network where we have flow, sorry, parallel network, this one would be in terms of behavior between upstream and downstream. We can define them in terms of a, a series network. between upstream and downstream. Or we could define it, I suppose, between a, a branched network. Between, I should do it, do it this way, a branch network between upstream and downstream. Where these are the individual form of the, of the systems that we have. The Behaviors are written in terms of the water levels, the fluid levels typically in the system. So this is um, a delta Z between upstream and downstream. Again, you need to write the energy equation, but I guess what's specific in each of these circumstances is that for um, par parallel flow, 
uh, the sum of flow rates is the total flow rate, individual terms individually, so flow rate uh, for pipe 1 and flow rate for pipe 2 gives you the total flow rates. Um, and so the magnitudes of the head drops in each of these have to be the same, etc. For these flows, um, the flow rates in each unit, Q1 is equal to Q2, which is equal to Q3, just from continuity. And so in that particular case, the, it's the head losses which are summed. Total head loss is equal to HL1 plus HL2, etc. And for a branch network, uh, typically since in this particular case the branches both go through this point, if this is pipe 1, 2, and 3, then the head loss in 2 by definition has to be equal to the head loss in three because they're both going into the same tank from an upstream head which would be at this location here rather than the upstream tank and into the downstream tank and so this is the case that these two uh, circuits both have the same head loss within them so that defines the behavior for um, pipe flow networks so the reason for doing it over here was that if we look now at the behavior for um, external flows, then the response for external flows is actually very similar to the behavior for uh, pipe flows, it just happens to be on the outside of the pipe rather than the inside of the pipe and behaviors in a schematic way are typically drawn in the same way where we now have an Euler number which is the same as either the coefficient of drag or the coefficient of lift in the system it's a function of Reynolds number um, it's laminar to one side it's turbulent to the other side. Again, the drag coefficient, for instance, for a sphere, is something like uh, 24 over the Reynolds number. Uh, and the Reynolds number, again, is defined in the same way in that it's um, a flow velocity, um, a density of the fluid, and a diameter not to be confused with the drag coefficient here. So maybe it's best to write it as lowercase d and divided through by the viscosity. And so the important thing with this, as in pipe flow behavior, is that in the laminar regime it's a function of Reynolds number. And when we want to solve problems to define, for instance, the forces which are applied on structures, then we can define the coefficient of drag or the coefficient of lift as equal to a drag force divided through by a half density of the fluid, um, velocity of flow squared, and an area. The area may be the planiform area of a wing, or it may be the frontal area that the flow sees. Um, if you need to know that, then you have to, to know that. Uh, but regardless, from this expression, typically what we'd like to know is the drag force or the lift force which is applied. And so we can get that merely by rearranging that expression in terms of the drag force. And that gives us coefficient of drag, which we can get from this, multiplied by a half rho v squared times and so if you want to define the forces that are applied on a structure, you can write it in this term. If you have a force and you want to know what equivalent velocity, you can write it also that way. And so that's the mode in which uh, we can define behaviors.
often uh, we're balancing forces on structures. So we're taking um, the sum of forces equals mass times acceleration. If there's no acceleration, then this is just equal to zero. And so it's a force balance. And so we'd like to know what the, the drag force would be that resists flow or what the lift force we have to apply to lift up a body of a given weight uh, and be able to solve for a system that way. The only reason to show this in this form is that typically the way that you solve this, you'll always use this expression. Um, but if, for instance, you're solving for magnitudes of uh, velocities of structures, then in this regime, the coefficient of drag is a function, not force, but a function of Reynolds number. And so when you substitute um, Reynolds number in for this, Reynolds number already has a velocity in it. So the solution you'll get will end up having a power of velocity of one, and it's going to be proportional to um, the viscosity of the system and some other components. But the viscosity will remain because the viscosity comes in through the Reynolds number. In the turbulent regime, then the coefficient of drag is not a function of the Reynolds number. And therefore, viscosity won't end up in this equation, and, but density will. And so the behavior will be a function of the, the density of the system. And so now the velocity will be a function of v squared because you don't lose this term because of the velocity in the Reynolds number. And it'll be proportional to um, the density and some other terms, but not the viscosity as it was previously. So the solution that you apply to it will be slightly different depending on whether it's laminar or turbulent. In either case, if you know what the Reynolds number is, you can immediately calculate what the friction factor is or the coefficient of drag or lift and be able to solve the, uh, the problem that way. Uh, typically, we're solving systems for the forces that would be applied on it. And so if you're looking at flow around an object, then you have to understand the, the geometry of the flow that you have that contributes to that behavior. And so in this particular case, there would be a drag force pulling upwards. You would have a weight which is pulling downwards. And depending on the fluid, you might have a buoyant force which is acting upwards, which would be just the, the volume of the object multiplied by the unit weight of the fluid. And so resolving those allows you to calculate uh, what the uh, velocity would be. Alternatively, if you're interested in calculating what the forces are that are applied on some kind of composite structure, then you can look at the drag force which is applied on one component the drag force which is applied on a second component and you can either uh, sum these terms to be able to see what the sum of forces are in that particular area or you could take moments uh, about the base to be able to understand what the moment would be applied that's resisting these two two forces that are applied in the system and so that's uh, the way to be able to calculate remnant forces on structures um, so for open channel flows, then um, we know that we can define behaviors in channels in this particular case where we have some kind of flow in a channel between uh, upstream and downstream to define this particular behavior. Uh, we have some depth of fluid, which is the main thing that makes flow in channels different from external flows or pipe flows because the extra degree of freedom, if you like, is the, the height of flow that we potentially have. 
typically define as y. Um, there is a flow between uh, a gradient between the upstream and the downstream where the head drop over a length L defines the driving gradient, which is the gravitational push that drives the flow. And we can define um, a width, an overall width of the channel, but also a unit width of a channel and its depth to define an area in which we have a volumetric flow per unit length, which we call Q, or an average flow velocity within the channel, which we can call V bar. And we also know that if we have a, a width of the channel, then V bar times the area is just the total flow rate Q. And so in this particular case, the area would be the width W and the depth Y. And so we can use those as our common variables describing that uh, particular system. If we define some components, we define the hydraulic radius as equal to the area of flow divided by the perimeter. In this particular case, the perimeter would be uh, this wetted part, which is green which I suppose in our particular case, P would be equal to the width plus two times Y. And the area would be equal to uh, the depth times the width. And so we can define the hydraulic radius in that particular case. The Reynolds number also is defined again as a velocity, a density, uh, a hydraulic radius, and a viscosity. We don't use that very much because almost always we are turbulent and so if that's the case then the, uh, the equivalent of drag coefficients or friction factors are always just a, a constant. Um, and so we can look at behavior for both uh, uniform flows and also gradually varying flows. So for uniform flows We use the, the Manning equation, which is just that the average velocity is equal to some coefficient divided by the Manning coefficient divide, multiplied by the hydraulic radius to the power 2 over 3 multiplied by the inclination of the uh, bed to the power half. And so this inclination is just equal to the, the drop per unit length of flow given by by d over uh, L in this particular case. And if we want to get the volumetric flow rate, we just multiply the average flow velocity by the cross-sectional area. And this term here in SI units always is equal to one. So we don't have to worry uh, too much about that. If we look at gradually varying flows, uh, then what's different is that this uh, depth of flow can configure itself into one of two different ways. It can either be shallow and flowing very quickly, or it can be deep and flowing more slowly. And both of them are equally admissible. And so we usually represent that behavior in terms of a uh, specific energy diagram that looks something like this. that has energy versus depth, that has a line which is at 45 degrees, where uh, y is equal to e. And uh, under this curve, there's a relationship like this with at the tip of the nose. Um, this represents the critical depth where it transitions from uh, subcritical to supercritical flow. And this is where energy is at a minimum. 
and energy is just defined as specific energy is the depth of flow plus um, the flow rate per unit width divided by two times gravity times y, the depth squared. And so this y is the depth in this particular case. And uh, this flow rate is really the flow rate that occurs in this small um, uh, channel, which is of unit width one and depth equal to whatever the flow depth. And the significance of this, I suppose, is that for a given energy, if there are no energy losses in the system, the flow can either organize itself at either this depth here or this depth here. And so this represents a depth, a shallow depth, which is flowing at very high velocity. And this is a deeper depth, which is flowing at relatively lower velocity. And physically what this represents is the case where if you imagine a depth of flow here, that this here is this lower depth, y1, and this upper depth here is y2. And because of continuity, the same flows have to be occurring in each system. This isn't the big tank assumption. Then the cross-sectional area times the velocity has to equal the cross-sectional area times the velocity here. Clearly, this cross-sectional area is smaller, so the velocity here has to be larger. And so this is this demarcation in two different flow types. And so the two different flow types are for around this point here. This is for a Froude number, which is one, which is critical, so-called critical flow. This is a subcritical with the Froude number um, less than one. And this is supercritical. with the Froude number uh, greater than one. And so that demarks these two different behaviors on either side of, of this response. And this is related to the, the Froude number. And so the Froude number is defined as the ratio of the flow velocity that's occurring. So in other words, this average flow velocity here divided by the velocity of the celerity wave. And so we can also, we've also stated this as equal to gravitational acceleration and the depth of flow square root. This is the same as the tsunami velocity that we looked at in the first week of class. And so the consequence of this is, is that in subcritical flow, um, when you drop a pebble into uh, the flow, the behavior you get is that the individual ripples from this pebble. Um, in the limit, if the flow velocity was zero, they would be concentric, but they are off, they're not concentric if there's a flow in this direction. Um, in the critical regime, then they, uh, you're just flowing at the rate downstream at the same rate as the wave transmission velocity upstream, and so they all meet at this point here. And in a supercritical regime, if you drop something in, then the evolution of that ripple as it goes downstream looks something like this. And so the key point, I guess, in the, this is that here, there's no information that travels upstream uh, from the downstream location as it moves. And so there's no information that goes from this downstream location to the upstream location. And so it can reconfigure itself in any way it likes. And so but the critical um, transition between these two regimes is for a Froude number of one, uh, which occurs at this minimum energy, where the ratios of this, uh, minim this minimum energy is related to the critical depth as three over two times y critical. Um, and that's it, I think. So those are the topics you need. So pipe flows, external flows, and open channel flows, uh, 
Everything you need to be able to solve the problems that we've talked about is in this um, uh, video. You just need to know how to use those respective uh, expressions and, and write the problems in a way you can work a solution out. Okay, thanks very much. Good luck. Great having you in class.